Here is a glimpse of China today after years of lightning fast growth. Investing legend Jim Rogers has been here all along and watched that explosive growth happen firsthand. I first came here in 1984. I was terrified because I'd been listening to American propaganda that the Chinese were evil, vicious, dangerous, bloodthirsty people. Didn't take me long to, of traveling around China to find out they're disciplined, educated, uh, ambitious, hardworking. Jim Rogers probably knows China more deeply than any other American today. When he came here in the early 80s, he traveled the entire country by motorcycle. Not once, but twice. He'll never forget what he saw. Uh, I mean, it was amazing to me. Everybody was up early, working, and they didn't stop. They worked all day and all night. They were saving, they were recycling everything. They, were, they weren't doing it to, be good right, to, right. to save the environment. Right. They were doing it to make money uh, in those days. And I could just see it was, it was everywhere. I could see the sense of education. I could see the ambition. I could see the, the, the sense that our children should have a better life. I mean, it was just everywhere. You were, you were a huge influence in my investing. I don't know where I got this particular idea, but I'd gotten all of the education that you were supposed to get in investing, and it seemed like well, none of this really makes any sense. Let me study who has actually made money in investing, and let's see how they do it differently. And uh, of course, you know, you were in Market Wizards, and I'm just trying to gather from wherever else that I could. So what makes people successful is different than what they taught me in school. And, uh, and of course, your track record at Quantum makes you uh, arguably, and maybe even inarguably, the best investor of our lifetimes, you know? So I, I was definitely gonna learn from you and uh, one thing that struck me in Market Wizards that I'm thankful that I learned was you said uh, uh, markets can go higher than you think and they can, go, they can fall further than you can possibly imagine. And when I started out, um, I started out as a broker specializing in international stocks. And in 93 is when I got into it. And the markets were just going vertical. Emerging markets were going crazy. Hong Kong stocks were what a lot of our customers were buying. I think in December of 93, Hong Kong stocks were up something like 25 plus percent in just the month of December of 93. And uh, I knew this was, this was a melt up, you know, this was, and I didn't, I didn't, I knew from, from, from reading, from reading your, uh, you know, what you'd said about these things that yes, these things can go crazy. And yes, there's a flip side of it as well. So, uh, so early on in my career, I experienced this, this sort of melt up idea and, uh, so I was probably 22 as a broker. I uh, I'd started college at 16 and, and uh, finished my MBA at 21. So uh, 22, I'm a broker, and, and I knew what I was in, and it was still really stunning to participate in. And still, uh, my, my income probably fell by 80% on the, on the downside because we were commission-based brokers. But uh, it was like, it was, so I want to thank you for, uh, for imparting that. And I've, I've made a lot of money. Um, off of, uh, off of that little piece of wisdom. And when Indonesia's down 90% in 1998, well, if it goes down another 50%, it's down 95%. These things are gonna happen. And, and so uh, you've lived through more of these melt up. You've, experienced, you've seen them come and go. So I definitely wanna talk about that a bit. Uh, obviously, we wanna talk about China a bit too. Um, so I am extremely bullish on Chinese stocks. There are three basic reasons. I'm just gonna kinda get it out up front here and then I'll, I'll let you riff and, and, and uh, so my, my core reasons for bullishness are one, Chinese A shares are, are, are just incredibly cheap, you know, relative to you know, however, you, however you size it up and they're incredibly hated and, and uh, but meanwhile, uh, there are two major tailwinds. Um, I mean, unbelievable tailwinds and you can add to this list if you'd like or, but uh, the first simple one is MSCI inclusion, you know, and uh, this is gonna add hundreds of billions of dollars. This is gonna change it from a retail-driven market to an institutional market. Uh, and this is a, maybe a five-year story or whatnot, but MSCI inclusion is a massive tailwind for Chinese A shares. And then the, the, the last piece of this is, there's a crazy, we're in a, we're in a moment where uh, it's, the, it's China's pension, um, major pension problem. In 2005, 5% of GDP 
was uh, in pensions. There, 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 essentially none. And meanwhile, you had a one-child policy where instead of most developing countries where you have two parents and five or six kids, in China you have two parents and one kid. And, two, and so you end up with this problem where there aren't enough workers to support the pensioners. And so China has to catch up extremely quickly. And they're doing all kinds of almost crazy things like authorizing up to 40% of Social Security uh, the Social Security Fund, 40% of it can be invested in equities. And so, um, again, this is a bit of a longer term story, but, um, you know, China needs to, to catch up on its pensions. It needs to get that money invested. It needs to put it in higher yielding things than, than, uh, than you know, boring bonds and such. And so I think that uh, we're going to have, we have an incredibly cheap market that's hated right now. We have this MSCI tailwind, and then an even bigger tailwind is this pension investing tailwind. So, uh, so those are kind of the two big things th that I wanted to talk about. And then, uh, but I also wanted to go back and it's almost 30 years since you took your, uh, or it's 30 years since you first year took, took your first trip across China. You've taken, is, are you, do you have the record, do you believe, for three cross country? Uh, uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> probably. So Nobody else would bother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well that's it. Uh, once you've done it twice, why do you need to do the third? Well, no, it's, great. it's great that you did and you got to see it again and I definitely want to hear your insights from that, and I'll just tell one, one more quick story up front is uh, my first trip to Shanghai was in the early 90s, and I stood, the, the, the most wrong that I've ever been about an investment was I stood at the office of, on the boond of Shanghai Lu Zhajui Finance and Trade Zone Development Company, and they showed me this table, I, it was like a double wide trailer on the boond, and they showed me this table that was maybe 30 feet long by 8 feet wide, it was a 3D model. Did you see, do you know I've what I'm? Seen, I, I've seen, not that one, but I've seen many. In and, China, yes. you know, there's no air conditioning. These guys are, it's, it doesn't seem like a, a, a highfalutin operation, you know? And uh, they say, this, you see this table? Look across there. And of course, all there is, there's, there's, there's maybe the, uh, the, the, the Pearl Tower. The, there's really nothing. This is going to look like Manhattan 10 years from now. And I've never been more wrong about anything in my life than, I almost started laughing when they said that this right oh, here oh, oh. is going to happen over there. And uh, I also went a, a couple blocks down just around the corner and, uh, and uh, went to the Shanghai Stock Exchange. Yep. And, uh, in the, and they, they, uh, they go in and no pictures, no pictures. And I thought, whoa, that's high security. And it turns out, you know what I'm going to say, it was that dingy hotel. It was that gross, dingy yep. hotel. And there's guys sleeping with their heads on their desks. and, and uh, you know, this didn't look like the future. So, but I know that you were one of the first people, maybe the first foreigner to buy stocks yeah, yeah. in uh, in uh, in uh, Shanghai. So, uh, so, so we've got some ground to cover, uh, and uh, I don't really know where you want to start, but I'd love to hear, you know, maybe a little bit on uh, what how things have changed from say your first trip across in 1988, was it? And. Uh, all the way across China was for 98, yes. Yeah. I, I motorcycled around another part. But I want to go back to something you said so before. I'm sorry, yeah. That what the main thing you learned was that what you learn in school is not going to help you <laughs> in yeah. the investment world. And I frequently tell people, don't get an MBA. You're wasting your time and your money. And everything you learn, you got to unlearn if you want to be successful in investing. But uh, now back to China. I first came here in 1984. I was terrified because I'd been listening to American propaganda. <laughs> the Chinese were evil, vicious, dangerous, bloodthirsty people. It didn't take me long to, of traveling around China to find out they're disciplined, educated, uh, ambitious, hardworking. Mao Zedong had been dead for several years by then, and it was really changing very quickly. I was not smart enough to see the extent of the change, but I knew this was a different kind of place. And I went back to New York and explaining on TV and other places that China, 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 and they all said, what? Japan, 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 as you may remember. Yep. <laughs> but so I, I saw something was happening here and became very bullish. I bought, went to the <laughs> Shanghai Stock Exchange in 1980, uh, 88, 88, uh, and started buying a little was bit. Was it the same, same dingy hotel? Yeah, it wasn't even a hotel. I yeah. didn't know it was a hotel. I they just converted thought it, it to the. Oh, stock is that what it was? Yeah. I just thought it was. On the a, corner of the boon, right? Yeah. No, the one I went to was not even. No, I went before that. Okay. Yeah, okay. no, that was before. The one I went to okay. was before that. Uh, 
they all had abacuses. Wow. They, didn't, they didn't have computers or anything. I mean, uh, adding machines, much less. Anyway, uh, I started investing back then. Uh, my real investments were in 99 is when I started investing in B shares in China. But I've been investing since. Uh, there will be problems along the way. But I moved to Asia because of China. I want my children to grow up speaking Mandarin and knowing, a, uh, knowing Asia. It's work. My children speak perfect Mandarin. And in their lifetime, China will be the most important country. You know, they, they're teenagers, little kids, little kids right now. Uh, so I hope that I'm preparing for them for the 21st century. But, Steve, that does not mean there won't be problems in China. America became the greatest country of the 20th century. Along the way, we had 15 depressions with a D. We had a horrible civil war. We had massacres in the streets. We had very little rule of law. You could buy and sell con you could still buy and sell congressmen, but in the yeah. 19th century they were cheap. You could right. buy four or five for the price of one now. So America had many problems along the way, but we became an astonishing success, the most successful country in the 20th century. So don't think that China won't have problems along the way. They will. But the Chinese have a wonderful word that we don't have in English. Uh, they've been around longer. It's Weiji, and Weiji means catastrophe and opportunity are the same thing. They go hand in hand. So when you see catastrophe, remember Weiji. And when you're panicked, and I'm panicked, <laughs> I hope we both remember Weiji and take advantage of the opportunities because they will be here. I mean, they're a billion, 300 million people. They save and invest. They save and invest over 35% of their income. We in America save 2 or 3% of our income. You know, America's the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. China's the largest creditor nation. I mean, there are many things going for China. China's the only country in history that's had recurring periods of greatness. Uh, China's been at the absolute top three or four times in history. They've collapsed, total disaster, three or four times in history. But they're the only country which, after a few decades or centuries at the bottom, has turned around. Great Britain was great once. Rome was great once. Egypt was great once. But China's been great three or four times. And in my view, they're on the rise again. They've been in decline for three or 400 years. Deng Xiaoping in 1978 said, we got to change things. You made a great point about that once. You said, uh, uh, well, you had a, a, a chapter of your book. Uh, one of them was the, the greatest capitalists in the world are communists, right? Yes. And, and uh, communist China. And you said that, uh, well, how long has China actually been communist? What? At least 500 years. Well, no, I, mean, I think you'd said, uh, like, you know, it was 28 years. It was only 28 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. Making, yeah, making the point yeah. that, you know, it only started in 1949. And so, even in 1986, or uh, 78 when he died, uh, 76 he died, that was 27 years that they had been communist uh, and they didn't like it because the Chinese, I mean, you can go anywhere in the world and you see Chinese capitalists and that's Absolutely. been the case for a long, long, long time. And Mao Zedong actually, so China was pure communist for literally 27 years. Yeah, glad you pointed it out. Uh, and Deng Xiaoping pretty quickly started changing it. And Deng Xiaoping said, I don't care if it's a black cat or a white cat, as long as it catches mice. And that was his approach, approach to life. And I mean, look out the window. Yeah. You'll see, you'll see uh, how dramatically it has changed. And but it will continue to change. You know, that is the biggest thing. I, I, even <coughs> it, took, it took getting my wife here last year for her to get over the idea that, well, you know, but they're communists. So um, yeah, I'd love for you to, if you have any comments on how we can get past that objection uh, from American investors. California is more communist than, than China is. Massachusetts, I'm sorry, what? California oh. is more communist than, than China is. Absolutely. Massachusetts is more communist than China. I mean, they call themselves communists. And, you know, I'm sure tomorrow they're going to say communism with a Chinese flavor or socialism yeah, yeah, with a Chinese yeah, that's flavor. It. That's what the term they use. Yeah. Socialism I mean, with a Massachusetts flavor. <laughs> they don't. They don't really know much about communism in China anymore, if they ever, I guess Mao at least thought he did. But beyond that, there's thousands of years. You go back to Chinese history and you see Chinese art and literature and everything, they're all capitalists. 
They're all scrambling to make a lot of money, and they do. You see some of these great old murals in China. It's amazing how many people are working and struggling to get rich, and a lot of them are. So, you know, you know all of these, uh, all the objections. Uh, one of the common things you hear about is, uh, well, China's debt, and you just said China's a huge creditor. So, how do we, how do we explain that, uh, you know, to the man on the street in America? Well, I'll just finish with the whole thing. Your, your wife and communists. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, they call themselves communists, but they were probably the best capitalists in the world in 2018, 2019, going You saw forward. that in 1990, though, right? Yeah, I saw it, yeah. You drive across, in the 80s, I drove across China uh, three times on my motorcycle, and yeah, I could see. Everybody was working their head off. It was shocking. I'd never seen anything like it. They would get up early, they'd work all day long, making not much money, but they wanted, they wanted to make money. They were disciplining their children in those days. They were educating their children in those days. No, you, so had, you had a crazy story about passing a chapter. Oh yeah, sure. that. Uh, well, that was they're, they're Christians. There are lots of Christians in China. It turns out. Uh, I think that most people wouldn't believe. Uh, I don't know if you can give a little backstory on well, that. Well, that was in 1999. My wife and I were driving around the world, and we were driving down the the one highway at that time, and and we saw. I mean, we kept driving, and we both said, "Was that a church?" And we saw two, three huge steeples with crosses, yeah. and we said, that was a church. So we turned around and went back, and it was a very large church, and we went inside, and they were singing Christmas carols, yeah. <laughs> to our astonishment. I mean, they were all these Chinese, singing them in English, I mean, in, uh, in uh, Chinese, but we could tell from the tunes yeah. what they were singing. And they said, yeah, we've been Christians here for a long time. Mao Zedong couldn't destroy us, and the church, the, the preacher is paid by the government. That's crazy. <laughs> you know, the, the government pays the preacher in a communist country, in an atheist country, and there are lots of churches. There are lots of mo mosques. If you go further to, to, the the, west, to the west, you'll see a lot of mosques, same kind of thing. I mean, there's a lot of religion here. There always has been for a long, long time, and there certainly is now. Uh, and there's capitalism. Mm -hmm. But they call themselves communists. You tell your wife that they call themselves communists, but they're among the best capitalists, and there are many religious people in, people are not religious, but there are not religious people in America, and in Europe as well, but there are many religious people in China, and there are lots of capitalists yep. in China, lots of capitalists. Um, now, uh, as far as the past and the future, uh, as I said, Deng Xiaoping started opening it up, and they have been opening it up ever since. Yes, there's certainly a, a lot of planned central economy in China, but even those guys are all trying to make money. I mean, it's, it's a different world, whether we like it or not. And I know many people in America say, communist? Well, they call themselves communists, but you know, Italy calls itself a Catholic nation. Yeah. Well, I don't think Italy is a very Catholic yeah. nation, for <laughs> instance. Uh, so there have been many things like that going on. And you, there's all this stuff about communist dictatorship. Uh, there is the Communist Party. It is a one-party state. But Japan was a one-party state. Mexico was a one-party state during lots of their great growth. So yes, this is true, but it has been changing a lot. When I first came here in 1984, there was one newspaper one TV, one way of thinking. The Communist Party acknowledges that there are thousands of demonstrations every year in China now, people demanding their rights. Many newspapers, many media outlets, the internet is everywhere. It's o overly controlled, if you ask me, but it's there. And everybody makes protests, and if they don't like something, the internet goes wild in China. I mean, it's not the Netherlands or something, it's not America, but it's certainly much more open than people seem to think. Well, so what I've seen is uh, w another big objection that you get in the States is, uh, oh, but, it, but it's all fake. They're only showing you what they want you to see. You know, you've heard this too, right? So, and, uh, oh, well, what about the ghost cities? What about the fake growth numbers? Meanwhile, if you've been here any, in any five-year stretch over the last 30 years, you know that growth is real, you know. Uh, so, but how, how, what can you do that hopefully we're going to reach people that don't know anything about China. So what can we tell them about 
you know, about these ideas. Well, first, when you say they're just showing you what they want you to see, may I suggest you get on your motorcycle and drive across China? Yeah. Ain't nobody showing you what they want you to see. You're on your motorcycle. You're heading out Even into in the, the wild. Even in the cities, you're, you're free to go wherever you no, want. No, I know. You can do anything you want. Yes, you can go to the bar. You can go everywhere. Lots of bars now. Lots of discos. They do all sorts of things. So that is no more true of China than I don't is know who true. they is, actually. That's, I didn't either. Anyway. Well, it's no more true of the U.S. than it is of China. Uh, people can say that about the U.S. and other places. As far as the numbers being fake, no, it's like you. I don't trust any government numbers. America, Germany, anybody. We've all been caught lying about our numbers, and I'm sure that the Chinese numbers or some of them are made up too. India, especially India. But it doesn't matter because, like you said, I've been coming here for 34 years. You walk down the street. You go That's to a different true. city. And you say, my God, last time I was here five years ago, none of this was here. And it all happened, and it happens very quickly in China, partly because it's a one-party state, and partly they get it done. In America, it takes you years just to build a new church or a new hospital or a new school even. And this is stuff that people supposedly support. So, so I know you're a free market guy, Jim, so how do you, how do you balance the, the supposed communism and the, and the, the direction the directed economy, the, the directed uh, construction and such with your free market ideas? Well, yes, uh, listen, I, I would abolish most governments. There's no question about that, and certainly all the rules and regulations for most governments. But there is a difference in a successful government and an unsuccessful government. That's one of the distinctions. In China, they get it done. Whether their methods are right or not, I don't. I live in Singapore. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy who built Singapore. I don't approve of some of the things he did, but Singapore has been an astonishingly successful country. You go to the Congo. I mean, he was a horrible dictator. He didn't get anything to show for it. You go to Singapore, it's an astonishing success story. Yeah. You come to China, it's an astonishing success story. So what is it that you saw? Like, when you, when you, were, when you were making your travels, you said, uh, well, Central Asia, well, this, this is never going to work. Well, China, this is definitely going to work. I mean, what is Mainly, it that you, what I saw, is it that you I saw the work ethic. Uh, it was a work ethic. I mean, you and I was driving on my motorcycle across the country and around the country, so I obviously saw it, and we got up early every morning to, to go. Uh, I mean, it was amazing to me. Everybody was up early, working, and they didn't stop. They worked all day and all night. They were saving. They were recycling everything. I um, mean, it was amazing. They were recycling because they needed it. They weren't doing it to, be good right, to right. save the environment. Right. They were doing it to make money uh, in those days. And I could just see it was, it was everywhere. I could see the sense of education. I could see the ambition. I could see the, the, the sense that our children should have a better life. I mean, it was just everywhere. And I, I, don't, think, I don't think I've ever seen it in any other country as powerful as I saw it driving across China on my motorcycle and in, in the car. I drove across China twice on a motorcycle, once in a car, and I drove around parts of China on a motorcycle once. And you, you couldn't help but see it. It was just the most mm -hmm. amazing thing. And I've motorcycled around the world twice. I have never seen it in any other country. Wow. This uh, sort of drive, this ambition. As I said before, China is the only country that's been great three or four times. And when Deng Xiaoping said, let's try something new, he knew what he was doing. He opened up the animal instincts in China. And as I said, go back and look at old Chinese art. They're all working. It's astonishing how they're all working. So, and uh, you've seen, the, uh, I don't know if you can talk a bit about the infrastructure changes that you've seen or the technology changes that you've seen. You drove on roads that didn't exist. You drove through deserts. You drove over mountains, literally. And now... We're in a place where, arguably, the infrastructure is, is better than it is at home. You know, I feel like I shouldn't say that too loud, but no. would you, you fly, agree? You fly into JFK, you immediately know you're in a third world airport. Yeah. I mean, if you've seen the world, you know you're in a third world airport. You get a, after you get through immigration, eventually, the long queues, you get in a third Smelly world taxi. Yeah. You go on a Put third world highway. Yeah, yeah. You can go to a third world five-star hotel. I mean, it, you, I mean, you go but Jim, to, uh, that's the greatest city in the world. Right? I know it is. I loved it. I lived there for decades. But it you was, come to Beijing and Shanghai, and you actually, to me, um, it, it, 
it's a, it's a, if I were to film a movie that was filmed 30 years in the future, I would do it in Pudong. Well, of course you would. And, you know, I'm an American citizen. You're an American citizen. I don't like saying these things. I right. don't like saying that JFK is a third world airport, but I've got to face reality. I mean, I can come to Shanghai or Beijing in the airport and see the difference. You can take the train. You're treated civilly as you go through security. Yeah, yeah, you, you, <laughs> and you get through very quickly. Uh, and are you going to take the train? And you, how do these guys do it? Yeah. How do they have nice, clean, fast trains that work? Take the New Haven Railroad, whatever yeah. it's called now. Uh, I mean, again, I don't like saying any of this. Right. Not make me happy saying this, but I have to deal with facts. But if you're an investor, if you don't deal in facts, you're not going to be an investor very long. You're going to be bankrupt. So that's one of the big, the big ideas for me of, of this documentary is that uh, uh, whenever you see a gap between reality, perception and reality, there's probably money to be made as, as perception um, converges towards reality. And I've never seen especially on a dollar scale, but I've never seen such a gap between perception and reality as the American perception of China as the place where your cheap t-shirts and your cheap electronics come from. Meanwhile, an apartment in Beijing or Shanghai is a couple million bucks. It, I can't afford to live here. So the perception <laughs> and the reality are, are extreme. I mean, would, would you agree? Well, I, I'm, I'm, if you can find little, that. I'm a little startled that you're, it's still that the case, that they still think this is the home of dictatorship communist and <laughs> cheap t-shirts. Yeah. Oh my it gosh, is. there's some of the highest class quality products in this country. I mean, uh, some you, of the... You, you can't have million dollar apartments and make cheap t-shirts profitably. It can't be done. Well, it's so, not just that. It's the restaurants, the shops. The, I mean, everybody's here. Every exclusive high-end product you can think of. I don't know, I got to name the name. Right outside is what? Was it Tiffany's? Uh, every oh, high-end brand. I know, they're all here. The Ferraris. There's a huge Tesla uh, um, charging station. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more high-end right here than anywhere I'm aware of in the States. But, I mean, even America, I mean, uh, General Motors makes more in China than it makes in America. Uh, there are many. Apple makes more in China than it makes in America. There are many major, major American companies, they know, right. <laughs> General Motors knows that, that China is a gigantic market for high quality products. Yeah, when I came here a few years ago and uh, WeChat, I, I, it, was, I, it was very clear the impact that WeChat was having on the people and I, I, uh, I immediately went home and uh, I actually gave a speech that I said, Tencent will become the world's largest company someday um, because... Why didn't you send me an email? Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we got a good entry point now, by the way. But, uh, I mean, so, uh, you know, you're, we're talking about the future, and really uh, uh, um, China has uh, definitely passed the U.S. on, uh, on technology, the integration of technology in every aspect of everyone's lives here. Do you have any uh, comments well, yeah, or thoughts you know, on that? That is a little bit embarrassing because when I go to the States, people are always saying we're the technological leaders in the world. And we do have Facebook, <laughs> if that's <laughs> technological leadership. Uh, but I, I see what's happening in China, and I see what's happening in other countries. The other day, I was in Beijing, and I was trying to buy an ice cream. She was a 19-year-old, I mean, young woman, and she couldn't sell me an ice cream because I had money. I had yeah. been Mimi. Yeah. She couldn't take money. Uh, I, I, you have to do it on your phone. Oh, yeah. Everything is on. I wish I were buying a Mercedes because yeah. <laughs> she gave me the ice cream in the end. Oh, really? She felt yeah. so sorry for this poor foreigner who couldn't. All he had was money. No. I mean, uh, the many things in China are, are ahead of the U.S. Again, I don't like saying it, Steve. I, I'm an American. My kids are Americans. My wife is American. But I have to face reality, and the Chinese are... Tencent, Alibaba, I mean, you know the names as well as I do. These are not little guys in the backyard somewhere. Right. These are major, gigantic powerhouses built on technology. Yeah, it was a real eye-opening when Uber came and spent a fortune um, trying to buy its way into China and, and getting in drivers and getting all the licenses. And, but the problem for Uber was they didn't have a button on WeChat. <laughs> Didi already had the button on WeChat, and Uber failed. Spent a fortune, but they couldn't break they could because they didn't have a button. Yeah, well, I, I have a button now. Oh, <laughs> I can well, buy ice cream yeah, now. There you go. <laughs> you know, even I yeah. am becoming technologically a little bit advanced.
So, so up to present, uh, um, so I, I gave you sort of the three pieces that I, so China, as you know, has, has had uh, in the last decade, or in the last dozen years now, there have been three separate sort of melt-ups. There have been three separate 100% plus moves, including one 500% plus uh, move in the entire stock market. And all those moves were in less than 18 months. So, um, so a prediction that I have out there now is that sometime in the next five years, uh, Chinese stocks will soar triple digits again within an 18-month period. It's sort of the virtuous, you, you know how it goes. It's a retail-driven market right now. Uh, once, uh, once that reflexive thing starts happening, um, it keeps going. And I think it's a conservative uh, thing to say, believe it or not, that uh, uh, I, think, I personally think it would actually be a larger move. I think that uh, we have these incredible tailwinds that will make it uh, one of the great moves of our lifetimes. And that's another reason I want to do this documentary. Well, so I wanted to get your thoughts on the present and, and these, these ideas. One thing I would add to your, uh, I mean, it's your, you're smarter than I am, but you know, fewer than 10, fewer than Can 9. Can you say that again a little louder? You're smarter than I am. You are. You know it as well as I do. There are fewer than, uh, I think it's 9% of Chinese have investment accounts, brokerage accounts. Well, in America, at least directly or indirectly, it's over 50%. So investing in China is pretty much unknown still. And there are a billion, 300 million of them. And as more and more of them learn about investing in stocks, whether they're forced to or do it because they see it on the internet or whatever, that is gigantic to go from 9% to 18%. We're talking about a billion, yeah. 300 million people. That's a lot of money coming into the markets in the future. And it's going to happen. It's certainly going to happen one way or the other. So there are other possibly bullish things going on here. And they are developing investment accounts, uh, pension accounts, as you know, uh, as, you, as you pointed out. So there are many good things happening. But, Steve, don't remember, I mean, don't forget that there will be bear markets. There will be problems. I remember that move when it went up 500%. Mm -hmm. But you know what the, the, other side the of next thing I was going to say. It's like every other bubble or semi-bubble. It collapsed. Yeah, well. It collapses. But yep. that's good. That's good. You want bubbles to collapse. Because then it cleans out the market and you can start over and have another bubble. That's right. You can have that's another right. big move. So sure. Yeah. China's got right now, uh, we mentioned debt and then got away from it, but China does have internal debt. They're the largest creditor nation with huge foreign currency reserves. But in China, some companies have built up debt. And those companies which deal with the West, when, when the West has problems, China's going to have problems too, especially if you are your customers. When your customers have problems, you have problems. Some of those Chinese companies now have debt, and they're going to be bankruptcies. Now, it's going to shock a lot of people, including me, and I just told you it's going to happen. And I'm going to be shocked and scared. But Beijing has said that when people get in trouble, we're going to let them go bankrupt. I wish in Washington, Right. I wish in London, they would say that right. too. But, and I don't know if the Chinese mean it, but they have said it. Now, they haven't been capitalists very long this time around, so I don't know if they mean it or not. But uh, they say we're going to let them go bankrupt. It'll be good for China, it'll be good for the world if they do it. So there are going to be problems. There's a lot of, in China right now, this peer-to-peer -peer lending has gotten to be very, very big. Uh, I can't remember, a few years Wolf ago, when, I, yeah, yeah. when you know, all these young people sitting in, at their computers selling loans to each other, right. to people. I said, how can that be? Right. It became, became a huge business, and like I said, how can it be? Well, problems are developing, and there will be more. But we had many, we had 15 depressions in well, the when U.S. When I was learning, you know, someone told me, uh, they can fall further than you can possibly imagine, right? So. <laughs> and they can go up more. You sell them short one day and you'll find out they go up much more That's than right. you can imagine. That's, right. That's the best way. I remember when I was first went into the business, I said to an old guy, should I, go to, should I go to uh, business school? And he said, nah, you forget business school. If you come down here and sell soybeans short once, you'll learn more than you'll ever learn at business yep. school. And he was right. I have sold short enough times to see things go up higher than anybody, including me, can imagine. So, yes. You, paid, you paid your tuition that way, right? I paid many. I paid for many MBAs yeah, uh, yeah. the hard way yeah. uh, by by shorting the wrong things, or not shorting the wrong things, but by the timing. The timing. Anyway, so China's will have problems, but 
they got a very high savings rate, much higher than we do in the U.S. The government has huge, gigantic reserves. America's the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Steve, we're not the largest debtor nation in the world. We're the largest debtor nation in the history yeah. of the world. Uh, occasionally, I see, or I'm on TV or something, and people will quote about American exceptionalism. I say, yeah, we're the largest debtor nation it's in the history of the world. Yeah. That's exceptional. That's a couple hundred thousand dollars of residents on the simplest. That's hard to compare. Uh, so the, we had problems. The Chinese will have problems, but and many companies which don't have debt, they have a high savings rate, the government has huge, huge reserves, and the government has said, we're not going to prop up failure. If people fail, we're going to let them. You know, yeah, the way the si system is supposed to work, people get into trouble. Well, competent people come, take over the assets, reorganize, and start over from a better, stronger base. In America, what we do is, when people get into trouble, the government takes the money away from the competent people, <laughs> gives it to the incompetent people, and says, now you compete with the competent people yeah. with their money. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, I hope China doesn't do that. Uh, but don't think they won't have problems. But that's the way the world works. Every individual or family or company or country that rises has problems along the way. We certainly did. They will, too. So uh, my, my simple thesis is that uh, the, the, the huge pile of money that's going to flow in is all going to flow into the top 5% of A shares because you've got uh, essentially uh, global fund managers who don't know anything about Chinese A shares. They're going to be benchmarking to MSCI. The only ones they can buy are the top. It's like India where you have this multi-tiered, the, 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 the blue chips are valued at this and everything else, the other 98% of stocks are valued at this. And, and no one knows anything about those other 98%. So, uh, and then, and then the uh, Chinese pension funds, of course, all they're going to buy is if you look at the, the Japanese with 75% plus of the Japanese government has 75% plus of the ETF market in I Japan, know. right? And uh, so that means they own all the all the blue chips. So, I think it's pretty pretty simple. If these are the two main tailwinds, that uh, the majority of uh, new money that's coming in, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars possibly a trillion dollars when you add the two together over five years, is all going to go into that top 5% uh, of uh, Chinese blue chips. That is the thesis which has been demonstrated many times in history. I've been so tell me where I'm wrong or, or tell I've me I've been what investing you think. longer than you, Steve, and whenever I, especially in the old days when I would go into a new market, I would buy the biggest 10 companies on the exchange because I knew that when the foreigners came, they would buy them too. They have to buy them. You know, you can't be a big mutual fund in America and go in and buy start Joe's liquor store. Right. You've got to buy the Big Ten or the Big 20, whatever it is. So, no, it's a thesis which has been proven many times. Eventually, of course, eventually, when everybody's learning about the markets, then they, they look for other things, too. But in the beginning, no, it's only the major, I won't even call them blue chips, the big names, the big right. liquid stocks that people will buy. Yeah, and not even because of the best, but because they are the largest in the index. It doesn't the most matter liquid. whether it's right or wrong, that's what they do. Yep. And they always have and they always will. Yep. So you're right. That's very insightful. Listen, Steve, I'm more bullish than you. When <laughs> yeah, you were you're here. You're when here. you were in college, you know, I was already here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> riding around on my motorcycle, starting to invest here and trying to tell people about China, China, China. Uh, all I want to do is just temper it by saying there will be bear markets, there will be companies going bankrupt, there will be mistakes, but I moved to Asia because what I see happening here, and I've seen it for over 30 years now, and I know there will be problems, but I'm looking for the problems because when they happen, I hope I'm smart enough to start buying. Yeah. I hope I'm starting smart enough to do something. So. Um and brave enough, <laughs> and brave enough. You know, but when Chinese companies start going bankrupt, and if Beijing lets them go bankrupt, everybody's going to be in a panic, including me. Including, I hope I'm smart enough and brave enough to do something. I would say it was a, it was a, it was a great part of my own. Uh, it was late 2008, and I said, okay, either it's the end of the world, or I need to back up the truck, and it's probably not the end of the world. So it's the only time in my life, not only did I take all of my available um, financial net worth, I took a home equity loan 
and uh, bought stocks. And I was, you know, a couple months early, but uh, it's, I'm still long. It's been a great trade. I know how to be early. Yeah, 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 I'm sure you do. <laughs> I did the same in the real estate market in, in 2011, uh, you know, it was, and it was, it was a great part of education to, to not only know that these busts happen, but that I have to take advantage of it. I have to step, now is the, when everybody is panicking, now is the moment to, to step up. And it's one thing to think it, and that's early on, but then when you're actually like, you know, what, what is uh, Soros's quote about, uh, don't, it takes courage to be a pig, right? So, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what I did in 08 and uh, 2011 in, in real estate in the well, States. For what it's worth, I frequently speak in universities, and they always say, what should we study? And I say, you should study history and philosophy. And they say, no, no, we want to be rich. Yeah. And I say, <laughs> you want to be rich or study history? You learn that all this has happened before, yep. and it's going to happen again, and that things change, but, but it changes, and you take advantage of the changes. Yeah, yep. The reason I bring that up is because you mentioned that you knew by 2008, you knew this had all happened before. Well, it's one thing to know, it's another thing to, 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 to be a pig, you know. Uh, it's <laughs> another thing to be brave. That's yeah. what I said before. I hope I'm brave enough yeah. when I see bankruptcies in China. Yeah. I hope I'm brave enough to do something. and have studied enough history that right. I'm prepared for it. So um, speaking of s the idea of a melt-up, you have, you, have, you have recognized them as, as much as anyone. Uh, you know, you've had a long career at this. You've been on the lookout for these types of opportunities. And here we are nine years into a bull market, 10 years into a bull market uh, in the US. Uh, so uh, um, you know, we can come back to China if there's more. but. Uh, I'd love to talk a bit uh, about uh, the U.S. and, uh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, U.S. to, to maybe a transition, the U.S. is making all-time highs. The Chinese market is down 60%. Now, I don't know if they taught you at school, but you're supposed to buy low and right. sell high. Right. So for me, in 2018, something that's down 60% might be more attractive than something making all-time highs doesn't necessarily mean that you have to buy it, but I'd rather start in a market that's down than one that's going through the roof. Yep. But uh, like I said, you were the one that taught me that market can go, markets can go higher than you could possibly imagine. And <laughs> to me, um, this does not feel like real estate in 2006 in the States. This does not feel like the NASDAQ in 1999. The, the US stock market this, this has been the most skeptical bull market um, I've, I've ever seen. And so we're nine years into this, and it's, it's the most hated bull market. It's, it's uh, the least participated, you know. And, and in my opinion, and uh, so m many great bull markets, but not all, end in sort of a melt-up phase. And uh, I, this is a great bull market, at least in duration. But we really haven't seen, you look at, uh, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you these things, uh, but I expect that we will see much greater public participation in this bull market. I expect, I strongly believe that we will see a melt-up phase. Now, it can be completely irrational. You know that's how these things go. It has to be. <laughs> and, these th and that's how these things work. So I would love to get your input on melt-ups that you've experienced, what they look like, what it feels like at a top. Does this current market resemble? See, they're all the same. If you go back and read your history, back to our earlier conversation, they're all the same. People say it's different this time. They talk about the new money, whatever it is, the foreign money that's coming in for whatever reason. There's always some new money. There's always new technology. It, I mean, they all, in 1999, the Wall Street Journal started writing about the new economy, capital N, capital E. I mean, they literally capitalized yeah. new economy in the Wall Street Journal, and I, they don't do it anymore. Um, but um, no, they all, you go back and read about every bull market, 29, any of them, they all say the same thing. The same thing, half people quit their jobs to go to become full-time investors. College students decide this is the future. I mean, it becomes everywhere. If you walk down Madison Avenue, there. TVs with the stock market. If you, it doesn't matter whether it's Frankfurt or, or New York, whatever it is, they all look the same. So just go back and read a few 
bubbles. Read about any bubble you want, and they're all exactly the same. They say the same thing. They act the same way. People do the same, take the same actions. You go to the dentist, and he doesn't want to talk about your teeth. He wants to talk about stocks. He yeah. wants to know hot tips, especially if he finds out. And, and not only the dentist, his receptionist also wants to talk right. about stocks. Yeah. So you know this ain't, the, this ain't the beginning of a bull market. We might be getting to the end. I thought in 1999, all of my friends were getting rich, getting stock options. And I was the idiot sitting there writing about the stock market and uh, you know, not participating. Uh, and uh, why am, what, what am I doing wrong here? And then, of course, you know, all of them ended up with nothing in, in the end there. And, uh, and then in 2006, I remember uh, we had a, a plumber come to the house. And he's like, I don't know why. I'm, I'm making so much money buying a house, painting it, and, and flipping it. I don't even know why. Now, plumbers actually make a decent living in the States, right? And he said, I don't even know why I'm bothering doing this anymore uh, because I'm making so much money flipping houses. And it's kind of like, ding, there's your, there's, yeah. your, there's your bell at the top. And I bring up these things because I don't see any friends or, or you know, you know, college graduates you know, choosing the stock market as, as the be-all, end-all for them. I don't see the plumber quitting his job to, to trade stocks or to buy houses. Um, so... So are you seeing these, so you've described these signs, and yes, we see them, and, uh, but I feel like, I, you know, it's, it's arguable, but I, I'd be interested to see, are, well, do you believe we're been, seeing those signs now? It's been a long time since we had a wild bubble in the U.S., uh, 1999, you know, the, the NASDAQ, what, double, triple in three months or six months, whatever the numbers Final are. Final six months, you yeah. Know, unbelievable numbers that happened. It happened in, in 68. I were, worked for Wall Street, uh, for a guy named Roy Newberger, who founded Newberger Berman, and he thought he, he had lost it yeah. because all these guys around him were making so much money. Uh, but he said to me, when the bear market comes, they're going to lose all everything they've made because they don't know why they made it. And he's, true, he's right. Now, you're saying you don't see those days yet, and maybe they're not. I mean, I'm not in the U.S. very much, so I don't really know the sort of mood, but if you're right, first of all, it usually is in not, it's usually in a handful of stocks. When I say a handful, 50 or 100, it's not, right. it's not the whole market that goes up, so you gotta be at the right place at the right time. Uh, and please tell me what they are. Yeah. <laughs> tell me those, those stocks. Uh, but also, why not, if, that, if it's going to happen, why wouldn't you buy Japan or China these markets are very depressed compared, and they have some great names, and there's lots of liquidity, and lots of people yet to buy them. So if the U.S. market is gonna skyrocket into a bubble, which it might very well. No, no, I see exactly what you're saying. But if that happens, wouldn't Japan up go up more? Wouldn't China go up more? I'm asking, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, oh, I, I own them both. And so, oh, yeah, okay, I mean, yeah. okay, 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 okay. You know, we're, we've been here talking about China. Obviously, you know how bullish I am on China. But uh, I get so much pushback on the idea that we could actually have this melt up. I think it's great that I get so much pushback because it tells me that the, the, the top is not here yet. And what I, what I did in, in 1999, Porter and I together actually, uh, we didn't. Uh, we accidentally were incredibly successful because we owned a basket of tech stocks and we had 25% trailing stops on them, and nothing turned back in those final six months. It was just a, you know, a vertical ride, and uh, then we basically got stopped out of everything. Essentially, uh, you know, by by the April issue of our letter that we were publishing, everything was gone, and we thought we were doing a disservice to our readers. We we you know, pocketed 900% uh, plus profits in some major names, but now we felt like we'd done the wrong thing because we're out. And uh, it, it, was, it, was no, it was no skill. We just happened to cut our losses at a good time. Wait six months later. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I know the rest of the story. Yeah. No, I mean, so uh, it was, uh, so what we're, what I will be doing is uh, continuing to, uh, to be long the narrow universe that has traditionally done well at these times, which, you know, even in 68, it's the tech names. It's, yeah, it's yeah, Ross Perot, it's, 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 it's uh, um, so, uh, and, then, and then we will we'll cut our losses, you know, we'll, we'll use a trailing stop and, uh, and 
I, of course, I could be wrong, you know, but... Uh, but you uh, have your trailing stops, it'll get you out. Right. If you're wrong. Yep, absolutely. I presume. And so any trade that you want to do, you want to have your, um, you know, uh, I, don't have to, I don't have to teach you this, right? Uh, but you, you want your upside to be greater than your downside. You have a smaller trailing stop and, and, uh, and you, you know, significant upside. And, and uh, so, um, and looking back, it's pretty extraordinary how often tech and biotech are that narrow sector. It's always the new era. It's yep. always, but nobody goes out and says, let's buy railroads and drive them up 30% a day, you know. Oh, and by the way, well, that's another. you're not going to put a crazy multiple on railroads either, right? So it's That's something. another sign, though. When, when you see in the markets that stocks are going up huge percentages every day, not every month, but every day. I mean, you just say, how can that be? But it happens in, the, in those phases, and that's when you know you're in a bubble. So how did you feel in 1999? How did you... Did you just avoid the thing entirely? You knew it was ridiculous, or was it was it the the Soros quote? Sorry, I keep bringing up these Soros quotes, but was it the Soros quote where look, you need to know what's going to bite you. You want to know what the trouble is as you're making money on the way. <coughs> well, in 1999, I was going around the world. Uh, yes, you were. That's right. In a car. You were that a little time, preoccupied. That time, you. no, no, but I I was shorting. I was shorting Amazon. I remember it very well. I was shorting a few of these these crazy names, and it was not fun. No, no, no. I was even, even out there in the wilds of Siberia, yeah. wherever. I was getting the, the notices that these stocks were skyrocketing and going through the roof. And it was not fun. It was painful. Fortunately, I had some longs, and fortunately, they eventually collapsed. They totally collapsed. I didn't have trading stops on my shorts. I should have at times. But in the end, I made a lot of money. But How about John Templeton, by the way? Going short, you know, the top 100 names at essentially exactly the right time. And Holding them all the way down. <laughs> well, kind John, of a good swan song for two. There's another guy smarter than me. <laughs> you know? uh, no, no, it, it can be done. The problem is, uh, Steve, you hear I'm the success. I, well, I know. You hear the success stories. You don't hear. In your case, if it's a, if it's not a success story, we'll hear about it because you're you're broadcasting it. Well, how many how many of my subscribers are actually going to cut their loss after they've made? You know, 1,200% in JDS Uniphase, and it's fallen 25%, and we tell them to take their 900% gain or whatever. How many of them, they've, they've fallen in love with this. How many of them are actually going to listen when you say, oh, now's the day to pull the plug? Well, I don't know your subscribers, but I hope they all do. I oh. hope they all do. I mean, I... The animal you, instincts are strong. You know this, but right? if you can, back to your comment about history and my comment, if you just read the history you know you've got to do it. You know you've got to do it. But Jim, this stock's never treated me bad before. I know. That's what, that's, that's what we get. I get. Yeah. I've been to the beach trying to pick up girls, too. Yeah, and yeah. they all treat me badly, you know, no matter how, how smart I think I am. They always treat me badly. So I would, uh, I've read my history. I know what will happen when yeah. the bear market comes and when the turn comes. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how wonderful those companies are. It doesn't matter how brilliant the management is and the products. You're going to lose your shirt. So after, after this melt up, though, I think we both agree on uh, sort of the meltdown that could follow. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but... Uh, I'll put them in your mouth. Okay. The next bear market is going to be the worst in my lifetime, and I'm older than you, Steve. It's, you know, especially if it happens the way you happen, you say it's going to, and it's likely to, certainly possible that it will, it's going to be horrendous. It's going to be a, a nightmare. The last bear market in 2008 was caused by too much debt. I mean, the debt has skyrocketed everywhere, even in China. In 2008, China had a lot of money saved for a rainy day. It started raining, they started spending it. Helped save the world. But now China has internal debt. Now even China has debt. So the next bear market, who's going to save us? Yeah. So I mean, who's uh, going to save? I mean, do you have yeah. any suggestions as who no. might save us? I, 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 no, I don't. The, the Federal Reserve, Inflation. That's it, <laughs> the, right? cent the central bank. In Inflation. They got to print as much as they can. They got to do everything they can. So what's the worst U.S. bear market that you've experienced? Uh, uh, 73, 74, 87. Well, I don't know. I'd have what, to go back. And I'm worst? sure the numbers are pretty easy to measure. What, what felt the worst? Oh, 73, all, 74 was feel. slow. Well, actually, we made a lot of money in 73, 74. Okay, yes, you did. So we're shorting the, the right? nifty 50s. That felt, I was shocked at how 
excited I was yeah. and how much fun that was. Uh, at first it wasn't. Same thing happened. We shorted them and then they kept going higher and higher. But then, my God, all of a sudden they started going down and they didn't stop. Yeah. J.P. Morgan, who bought every share of Avon it could and Polaroid and the rest of them, didn't have any more money. Right. <laughs> and they started going down and they just kept going. And kept. Anyway, uh, that one was a nice fun. They all, I mean, a lot of them have been fun. In 87, I was short the market. Uh, that was fun. On my, October the 19th was my birthday. It was the best birthday I ever had in my life. Uh, so, let's see, uh, 99, I remember. Fortunately, I was short. The Stocks, 2008. So what, what I was a, short. What's a bad bull market? Or what's a bad bear market feel like? I mean, it's, well, it this feels is wonderful nine, if you're short. Nine years, and you think about this. This is a nine-year bull market, but um, you know, the, the entire decade of the 90s was was a great boom too. So uh, you know, the, so so most investors have not lived through. I mean, obviously the the the, the Nasdaq bust, but that was a relatively narrow uh, universe of stocks, like we talked about. So. Most most uh, living investors have not experienced a legit bear well, market. If you're long, and <clears throat> so what are they in for? They're in for bankruptcy. I mean, they're going to lose everything. They're going to lose lose it all because anybody who is, even if you're not leveraged, the stocks in bear markets, Steve. Stocks go down much more than anybody can believe. Like in bull markets, they go up more. I mean, you cannot believe. Yep. You say the stock is down 80%. You know what? If it goes to 10, it's down 90%. Right. You know, and you can it can go you, down 90%. You lost an additional 50%. Yeah, yeah. You've lo you lost your amazing amounts of money. And it can happen. And people say they can't go down anymore. It's already down 90%. It can go down. It can go down another 90%. From where if a stock goes from 100 to 10, that's 90 percent. It can go to two. It can go to one, and often it does. So, so you have to be, and it happens in bear market, and people think it cannot happen, but it does. I mean, if you go back and read your history, don't listen to me. Go back and read your history, and you will see. So where, so where would where would people hide? Well, you can sell short. But most people are not going to do that because they don't know how or don't think of it or think it's, it's not good. Uh, they can go into cash, but most people, as you said, they won't do it because they've been making so much money. Uh, the way to hide, though, is to sell short, go into cash, go to another country. But in bear markets, everybody is suffering. Uh, become a farmer. I mean, it depends on, on your own skills. The best thing I can tell you is only do what you know only invest in what you know, and then you'll probably get out of some of these things. If you're long Alibaba and you know what you're doing, then you'll know what to do if it starts cracking. But if you're long Alibaba because somebody said to you, right. there's this company called Alibaba, blah, 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 and you, you don't know why you bought it. You know it's gone up you know, a lot and you made a lot of money, but you don't know, why to, you don't know what to do. That's why you won't sell it. Right. So my advice is only invest in what you yourself know a lot about, because then you'll know when to sell. Don't listen to me. If I sell it, I'm not going to call you and say, you know that stock I told you to buy? I sold it. And you're not going to know what to do, unless you only invest in what yourself know. Nobody wants to do it. They all want a hot tip. So here's a challenging question for you. We've been talking about the long-term opportunity in China, and uh, China historically has been uh, uncorrelated, not, negative, not negatively correlated, but uncorrelated to U.S. stocks, historically, A shares. And, uh, but if we have this great meltdown in the U.S. Uh, last years, last longer than people can imagine, goes further than people can imagine, uh, where, what happens to China, to China A shares? Not, not Tencent and Alibaba, but what happens to China A shares? Well, first, your comment about correlation, they've only had a market for 28 years. Yeah. I mean, it's not as though there's some long historical period here to look at. Uh, but China is now the second largest economy in the world. Uh, they have this very large stock market. And when everybody else is losing money, I assure you people are going to sell their Chinese shares. And people are going to be afraid. And even you, at one point, will sell your Chinese shares 
because you'll hit your stops, right. if, if nothing else. The next bear market is going to be the worst in my lifetime, which means it's going to be pretty horrendous, and everybody will be affected. Everybody will be affected. You know, the MSCI indexes will all go down. And even if, even if you say, yeah, but they have to buy Chinese yet. Okay, they do. Well, yeah. But they'll all go down. Yeah, that's because the, the holders of those funds will be withdrawing their money, and those folks will have to withdraw the money yes. from the Chinese markets. And Which leads me to ETFs. I don't know if you want to go there, but we all own ETFs now, including me, because it's so easy, lazy, yeah. and everybody. So uh, when uh, the now you actually literally own ETFs, right? With the new the new fund, you still uh, yeah, yeah, that's another story, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's another story. Uh, but when the bear market comes, we're all going to sell the same thing. So the ETF stocks are going to go down more than everything else. The stocks that aren't in the ETFs are the place to be because nobody owns them, right, right. so nobody can dump them. Right. The ETF stocks are going to get killed in the next bear market. Right. Well, it's the same theory that I had on the on the upside in China, in reverse on the downside. Everybody's going to be buying, you know, the top five percent, and that's what everybody would be selling here. But that will be true everywhere in the world. So you don't pick on China. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. It'll be true in Spain. It'll be true everywhere in the world. Yeah. That when the bear market comes, we all we all own many of the same stocks, especially now because of ETFs, and it's going to be horrendous. So, is there anywhere? Uh, uh, is there anywhere in, in any asset class that you're excited about? And there are many commodities right now that are incredibly hated, you know, reaching levels we've never seen. And well, the traders, you know. Yeah, uh, sugar. You should. Let me see. Do I have my sugar? Yeah, see. You have your sugar packet there? Yeah, yeah. get yourself some sugar. They, if they're serving coffee later. North Korea. There's no market in North Korea yet. Uh, Russia's really hated right now. That's the thing. It's always at five times earnings. I mean, when, when do you buy Russia? Well, I thought we were talking about things that won't get hurt so badly. Right. Uh, Russia There's won't no be money hurt. to leave, right? Yes, There's that's no right. That's what I mean. It's hated right now. So if you're in markets like that, you probably won't lose as much. Uh, but the place to be when a gigantic world bear market comes is not in stocks because mm -hmm. they all go down. There are always some that go up, even in the 30s. Some stocks went up, not many, but some stocks went up. Uh, and I'm certainly not smart enough to own those stocks. The place to be in a bear market is somewhere else. <laughs> Farming, you know, doing something that nobody else is doing. I'm certainly a fan of your stuff and what you're doing, all of you. Porter, I've known a long time. No, no, I'm keen. I'm keen on most of you. Uh, keep it up. My, my suggestion is, is keep it up. Uh, well, Mr. Trump says he wants to have a trade war, and, and the problem is he's always said things like that. It's not as though this is a new idea, and so it's in his soul. And when things go wrong, his reaction is have a trade war. To say, what I expect to happen is somewhere along the line, Mr. Trump or somebody is going to say, okay, we have a, we solved the problem. Whether they have or not, they're going to say they've solved the problem and make everybody look at. That may lead to your melt-up. Then everybody's going to say, Phew, okay, we're safe. We're safe. And that guy Steve was right. So we'll have the gigantic last move in the market. But then when things do start going wrong, for real, Trump, because his soul is trade war, then we're going to have the real trade war. Then he's going to come back and say, see, I told you. Hit him, hit him, hit him. Now, he really thinks he can win a trade war. I don't know if Mr. Trump doesn't know history. Yeah, has he heard of Smoot Hawley before? I don't know if he has, or even, but even if he has, he thinks he's smarter than history. He thinks he, he himself is smarter than history, and who cares about history? History is bunk, and I can beat history. I know he cannot. You, I guess you know he cannot. History shows he cannot, but he thinks he can. And that's the dangerous kind of people, the, think, the people who think that they can do something which they cannot, and they try. And the problem is we all suffer. You know, we're all going to suffer because that. could of be that. The, the smooth holly ringing the bell that, at the top that, right Yeah, that, well, that may lead to your melt-up uh, and then your total collapse. And my, I told you the next bear market's going to be the worst in my lifetime. 
that would be what's going to do it if he comes in at that point and says, we're going to show them I'm smarter than they are. We can beat them, and we will beat them. <sighs> be worried. Be wor very worried. Uh, and uh, nobody's ever won a trade war. I'm not the only one who They're knows that. They're easy to win, Jim. I know they are if you're Mr. Trump. Unfortunately, I mean, I mean I'm, not mis I'm not as smart as Mr. Trump. So I know that. I know that they can be very dangerous and very destructive, and they always have been. And the worst is it's hard to get out of them. You know, because then you got to save face. It's like a real war. Yeah. Nobody will get out of the real war because they got to save face. But in the meantime, a lot of people suffer very, very badly, and that's always happened with trade wars. So be worried. What you should do is read Stansbury research, and then you will know what to do, and how to handle it, and how to make a lot of money. And you're talking about the U.S. nine yeah, years in. Yeah, I mean, well, they, they they all look the same. Uh, the, the 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 stocks going up get narrower and narrower, even in the big bubble in 1999. Not every stock. The Nasdaq went straight through the roof. Uh, it got extremely narrow. Yeah. yeah they all get narrow. We and haven't narrow gotten narrow end. yet, though. I mean. Well, it's somewhat narrow. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. You take out the the fangs or whatever they're called. I think you'll find that the stock market's not up yeah. in 2018, whatever this is. It is narrowing, but at the end, it always gets narrow and narrow, and, and some of that's happening now. Uh, but I'm not in the U.S., so I don't see, what, one of the things I noticed is the markets are getting narrower and narrower. You know, many, in 2007, Iceland went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because of what's Iceland? I didn't, if they noticed, they didn't think about it at all. But then Ireland went bankrupt. Um, very few people. Then Bear Stearns went bankrupt. Then the next thing, Lehman Brothers. By then, everybody knew, oh, my God, something's wrong. And that's the way it always happens. I can remember the previous bear market in yeah. the 73, 74. Equity funding went bankrupt. Well, who cared? That was early 73. But then by 74, when the things were collapsing, we all knew that had been an early sign yeah. that something was going wrong. Well, right now we have Argentina. I won't even, we don't have to no, no, it's give you the really, list. Argentina, yeah. Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe that is the Iceland, yeah. the Ireland of the last bear market. Yeah, you, you know, you had Thailand in 98. and just... Yeah, well done. They had the Asia crisis in 98, which led to the bear market of, in the U.S., 2000. You had to wait a while, but you always have to wait a while because it starts in, in the marginal areas that right. people aren't watching or that are small, that people think, who cares? Yep. It's too small. Then eventually it snowballs, and then we all said, oh my goodness, look what has happened here as we're all losing our shirts. Uh, and that will probably happen again. And so maybe these are early harbingers of what's coming down the road. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you can't have those final gasps in a few stocks or in some stocks, especially if Mr. Trump does something like says, okay, trade war's over, we've solved all the problems, I beat them, yeah. I showed them. Yeah. No so, chance that he'll do that, right? There's yeah. <laughs> no, no chance he'll take an opportunity to beat his chest, right? But if he does, if he does win it, win it now and says, see, I showed you, then we'll have the big, big gasp the last uh, gasp, uh, the melt-up, as you call it, which will lead to the worst bear market in my lifetime. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you. Did, we, did we get it?